بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه الغر الميامين الحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية سيدي ومولاي علي بن أبي طالب الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله أما بعد the following is the narration of the sermon of Sayyida Zainab عليه السلام in the majlis of Yazid in Sham all praises due to Allah, Master of the world, and peace and blessings be on my grandfather, the Prophet. Allah was right when he said, evil will be the end for those who committed evil because they rejected our communications and used to mock at them. O oh, Yazid, do you think that God has made you honorable and made us contemptible now that in your belief you've held us as captives, have blocked the earth's zones and the heaven's horizons and have left no solution for us? Do you think that your reputation before God has led you to victory? You crow with pleasure now that the world has turned for you. Our affairs are arranged for you and our government is allocated to you. Get off your high horse. Have you not read in the Quran when Allah says, Let not those who disbelieve think that our granting them respite is good for their souls. Rather we grant them respite so they may add to their sins. And for them there is a painful chastisement. O Yazid, O you whose father was freed by my grandfather, is it fair that you place your wives and ladies behind a curtain while the daughters of the Prophet are taken from city to city as captives? Is it fair that you disgrace them and you unveil their faces? so that all can see them from the stranger to the acquaintance from the noble to the ignoble while there is none to defend them how can i hope for sympathy and compassion from someone who came from the true liver of the noble and was born from the flesh of the martyrs O oh, yazid you don't consider yourself a sinner nor a sinner over this mortal blow. You boast about your disbeliever ancestors, wishing that they were present to see what you have done. You poke the teeth of Abi Abdullah, 
the heavenly progeny of Abdul Muttalib, the children of Abdul Muttalib and the heavenly stars on earth. But we'll be patient since soon you'll be joining them and then you'll wish that you were dumb and that you had not acted what you acted or said what you said. We'll be patient. O oh Allah, give us our revenge and our due right and give him a painful chastisement. O oh Yazid, by Allah, you've cloven your own skin and flesh. Soon you'll meet the messenger of Allah where distress turns into tranquility with the heavy burden that you have. You've held his children as captives. You've disgraced them and you've shed the blood of his house. But do not forget what the Quran says when it states, do not count those who have died in the way of Allah as being dead. Rather they are alive, receiving sustenance from their Lord. Enough for us is that God is the judge. Muhammad is the supporter and Jibra'il is the defender. Those who pave the way for you to dominate over us will find out whose army is weaker and whose thoughts are inferior. Although the plight has made me speak to you, I find speaking to you of little value, but I find scolding you is great. Therefore, I'll continue to scold you. The eyes are tearful and the heart is sorrowful. How ironic it is that the members of the party of Allah are killed by the members of the party of Satan. Our blood drips from your pores and our flesh drips from your teeth. But O oh Yazid, however hard you try, you'll never obliterate our love and our memory from the hearts of the people. What you consider as booty today, you will realize is indemnity tomorrow. O oh Yazid, your ideas are unstable and your government is transitory. Soon you'll meet the Lord and you'll hear the cry of the removal of the mercy and the curse on the people who were oppressors. I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for concluding the mission of the chiefs of paradise with prosperity and accommodating them with paradise. All I ask Allah is for the forgiveness and for the elevation of ranks. For Allah is the Omnipotent. The following was the sermon of the great female saint Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam. No doubt she deserves the title of saint. Or indeed the title of sainthood. Because without a doubt when we come to the term saint, we either use it in our everyday language or we use it with religious connotations. In terms of our everyday language, whenever you come across somebody of impeccable pure character, straight away you say that person's a saint. Because you recognize that the person's morality is the highest morality. You recognize that their nature is the purest nature. So when you talk of a person who you want to give the best character reference to, you straight away say that that person is a saint. In opposite to that person is a sinner. There is an opposite between a saint and a sinner or a saint and a devil. Because a person who is a saint in our everyday language is someone in reality who you look at and they cannot put a foot wrong. Put them in a difficult moment or put them in times of prosperity and peace. And you'll see that they cannot do any wrong. So in our everyday language the term saint is applied. Likewise, however, you find that the term saint or sainthood has religious connotations as well. If one was to look at, for example, religions such as Christianity, there are certain people who may be seen as saints in their lifetime or indeed saints after they die. So you may have, for example, Saint Augustine on one hand, or you may have somebody like Mother Teresa on the other. 
You'll find that with sainthood in religion, normally there are a number of key aspects that are related to a saint. On the first level is shifa, that there is a recognition of a sort of miraculous feature in relation to that personality. So when you go to that personality shrine, for example, you feel that there is a chance that somebody who otherwise is unwell or otherwise is physically challenged may be cured by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the name of the saint has been invoked. Ask anybody who has been, for example, to Sham. They will say to you that all of a sudden, while you are visiting the grave of Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, you feel that all of a sudden somebody has screamed. When you go near them, they say that someone blind can now see. They say that someone who was paralyzed can now walk. They say that someone who may have had a virus or an illness, it's now gone. Because the first aspect of any saint is there is a concept of a cure within their character. What we call shifa. So you find that if, for example, you come near any area where a saint is buried, whether in Islam or other than Islam, the people expect some sort of remedy for their bodies from being around that area. Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam, therefore on the first level in being a female saint is related to the shifa aspect, related to her shrine being a center of curing those who are sick or those who are unwell. On the second aspect is shafa'ah, intercessory. That a person feels if they ask God by mentioning Zainab or mentioning the oppression against Zainab or mentioning the loneliness of Zainab or mentioning how Zainab was a stranger or bringing the title of Masa'ib next to Zainab, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would answer your dua because you've mentioned Zainab. Ultimately, Allah is the one who cures. Allah is the one who answers supplications. But there's an intercessory feel to any saint. When you call out Mother Teresa, for example, as some people did, it's because they felt there's a connection between her and between God. And likewise for us, when we come to the female saint that is Zainab, there is a feeling of wasila on the one hand and shafa'a on the other. Wasila in this lifetime, if for example, somebody wanted to ask Allah through Sayyidah Zainab, and shafa'a when? On the day of? judgment that on the day of judgment i ask allah ya allah allow me to have the intercession of this saint by the name of zainab salam. the same way i'd want the intercession of the saint known as maryam or the saint known as khadija for example alayhim salam. so that's on the second level on the third level a saint for what reason on the third level because that you can have vows made with her name what you call a mannat or you call a nidr, or you call a sufra. These things were part and parcel of those who, for example, either lived around the shrine of Sayyidah Zainab, alayhi salam, or exist until today in parts of Iraq, or parts of Pakistan, or parts of Iran. That someone does a sufra in the name of Sayyidah Zainab, alayhi salam. Some people do it every Tuesday, for example, in the name of Sayyidah Zainab, alayhi salam. So there's a the third aspect, which is what? Which is the aspect of a nidr using the name of Zainab, alayhi salam. How many times in our cultures, we have a mannat in the name of Hazrat Abbas, Umm al -Baneen, Bibi Fatima. These are all wonderful ways of connecting with Allah and with the Ahlul Bayt. Salawatullah wa salamu alayhim. That's on the third level. On the fourth level, a saint has this position of guardianship and a position of love. Any saint is either a guardian of a message or a person who's the object of love. Either the object of the love of other saints of Allah, like her brother Hussein alayhi salam, or the object of love of her followers, what is called wilaya and walaya. So she is the object of love of the followers and the guardian of the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because the reality is that without Zainab alayhi salam, Islam would not have been protected after Karbala. She became the guardian of Allah's message on earth. But the fifth area of any saint is fundamental. What is it? It's that through the hardest trials and most difficult times, they come out as a bright shining light. Look at any saint and you'll always see that they had to live lives of trials. Poverty, for example, loss of life, loss of wealth, torture, oppression. But at the end, they look at the world with only seeing beauty rather than seeing negativity. 
They look at the world and they realize that number one, everybody is destined to die. If Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi has to meet Malik al then all of us have to meet Malik al -Maut. Because if there's one person who could get away with it, if God wanted to, it would be him. Ultimately, the saint looks at the world with a perspective that's a different perspective. And that's why it surprises me when I see courses on gender and feminism that hardly ever is Zainab السلام, mentioned as that matriarchal female who's speaking out about the inherent patriarchal authority. Normally, who's mentioned? Aisha, the wife of Rasulullah is normally mentioned as the archetype, female, prototype, role model, because when she fought Imam Ali السلام, at the Battle of Jamal, and when she led thousands of soldiers to fight Imam Ali alayhi salam, and when she led thousands of soldiers to fight Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, when she led that army, many in gender studies would look at her and say, that is true feminism. That here is a lady who was leading an army of men against the caliph of her time. Of course, to some, this contradictory when you see. Somebody telling you that my role model is Aisha, and you say, why? Say, because she led an army of men, but an army against who? As in surely you have a conscience that on the day of judgment, you have to say that I admire the one who led an army against Ahl Muhammad and against Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. But it's okay if a person wants to study this. That's one framework. But another framework is Zainab's mother and Zainab. On the one hand, you have Zainab's mother, who is the ultimate of Shi'i female sainthood, because she is the greatest to have ever walked on the face of the earth, who gave already a prototype in the feminist worldview that here is a lady standing up against the males of her time who are trying to confiscate her rights of property and inheritance. Who did Zainab السلام, therefore learn this from? From her mother Fatima السلام, that Zainab in Damascus stands in front of the male of her time in front of who? The patriarchal inherited authority of the Umayyads and shows that nothing's going to stop me from speaking out. Even though she knows she's a slap away, although she's been slapped so much before. And even though she knows she's a kick away, even though she had been kicked so much before. And even though she knew she's a whip away, but she knew she had been whipped so much before. But she showed for all females and males around the world that don't let the power structure in front of you degrade you. Stand up. Use the gifts that God's given you. So for us, when we look at tonight, Sayyidah Zainab, the female saint, every aspect of intercession, of cure, of a relationship with God and relationship with love and relationship with trial emerges. Let us tonight examine the context of the emergence of the saint Zainab when it came to Sham, and I'd like to do this in the following stages. Number one, what had taken place just before this sermon and which lines of poetry were not only provocative, but were actual kufr of Yazid and highlighted his upbringing. Number two, how does she use the Quran from the beginning to highlight that don't say Allah loves everybody because there are some who do not receive Allah's love. Number three, how did she highlight to Yazid that you crow with pleasure now that our government is allocated to you? But get off your high horse. Long life doesn't mean good human being. Number four, how does she focus on the hijab and on the sitter and on the fact that that veil should not stop anyone from reaching the highest level? Number five, how did she remind him about the fact that his grandmother was a cannibal? And that just in case you forgot, that's the type of family that you come from. Number six, how did she show a person's body dies, but a shaheed's legacy remains alive? Number seven, how did she highlight that Yazid, you're from the army of shaitan. Anyone who says, Radhi Allah, and about you is from that same army. And finally, how did she highlight that however hard every empire tries, However hard every single paid author tries, you'll never remove the love of Zainab from the hearts of the people. Let's examine this and dissect the topic in complete depth. The context of what took place with Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam highlights the kufr of Yazid bin Muawiyah. The disbelief completely in the religion of Islam. 
Because when you have some people who will say that Yazid is a Khalifa, you shouldn't say much about him, leave him alone. Don't say good, but don't say bad. Don't curse and so on. Yazid quoted lines of poetry, which were the most provocative lines just before Sayyidah Zainab السلام, had given her, ser her sermon. Of course, Yazid had already been provoking. He had cursed Imam Ali alayhi salam. He had cursed Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He had been poking the teeth of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He had already provoked them non stop. Zainab as the saint, a part of her sainthood is her purity and her immaculate nature. She is not affected by his animalistic instincts. She maintains her composure. Even when Yazid had invited somebody who was sitting next to him, who said to him that that young girl, daughter of Hussein, I want her to be my slave. And of course, that daughter of the Imam turned around to her auntie. She said, auntie, orphan and then slave? Is this fair? Say the Zainab turned around to him and made it clear to him, there's no way that you touch her. My grandfather brought your grandfather into this religion. It's because of him that your, grand, your father was guided. So therefore you don't come near us. She had already maintained her composure. Yazid came out with lines of poetry. What were those lines? Yazid's grandfather, from which side? His great grandfather from his mom's side was the leader of the opposition at the Battle of Badr by the name of Utbah bin Rabi'ah. Ah. Yazid had loved his grandparents and his great-grandparents. And he wanted to boast because this was a day of victory. He would always repeat, Karbala for Badr. And he would make that clear. We lost in Badr, we won at Karbala. So he made it clear that, you know what, this is the best moment for me to remind Ali's daughter, Muhammad's granddaughter, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, that we are now victorious. He used the lines of poetry of a famous poet by the name of Abdullah, the son of Zabara. That was a famous Jahili poet. And in the poetry, he changed a couple and added a couple of lines. He said, Later, Ashiyahi bi Badrin Shahidu. I wish my ancestors from Badr were here now. Now, Badr was how many years before this incident? Badr was 59 years before this incident. In other words, the whole of Karbala was the return of Kufr and Shirk versus Islam. Simple as that. Don't bring me none of this Bani Hashim versus Bani Umayyah political. This is no. This is Islam, Kufr, Shirk. He said later, Ashiyahi bi Badrin shahidu. Jaza al Khazraj min waq al Asa. La ahallu wa stahallu faraha. Thumma qalu ya Yazid la tushal. Laibat Hashim bil mulk. Fala khabarun jaa wa la wahyun nazal. He praises his ancestors, boasts about them. I wish they were here to see what I've done. Then he says what? Hashim played with mulk. I ask you, the message of Rasulullah is kingship? No. Message of Rasulullah is deen. Message of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi is taqwa. He says, no, in our eyes, we never saw it as that. You were a king for a certain period. La'ibat, la'ib, yala'ab, to play. They played with kingdom. There was no news that came and there was no revelation. There's no wahi. Means I reject Jibra'il. I reject that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was a prophet. Of course, if you're capturing his granddaughter and putting her in chains, I don't really think you believe he's a prophet. And on top of that, this whole idea of prophethood and Islam, I reject completely. When he said that, Sayyidah Zainab salam felt at this moment, it's the moment the saint has to rise. The moment that all of her abilities to be a guardian of God's message, to bring the love of the people back to Islam, to be an intercessor for the people between them and Allah, with her immaculate nature, has to emerge. She stood up, Yazid and everybody around her, and she began. And when she began, what did she say? Straight away, praising Allah. I ask you, when you go through trials and tribulations, how many of us say Alhamdulillah, even though we go through trials? It's a test. Because you always have those doubts that creep into your mind mentally. Why should I say Alhamdulillah? Look at what I'm going through. Alhamdulillah is when everything's going well. When things aren't going well, I don't say Alhamdulillah. No, say the Zainab highlighted to us, stripped away all praises due to Allah. Master of all the worlds. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Straight away, because she's highlighting that my Lord has given me more than he's taken from me.
If you were to sit down and count how much Allah has given you, even with Karbala and Kufa and Sham, she believed that Allah has given her more than what Allah took from her. I say, Zainab, Allah took from you Aoun and Muhammad. Allah took from you Abbas. Allah took from you Hussein. Allah took from you Akbar and Qasim and all the rest. No. All of these you can count 17, 18, 20, 25. Have you counted the number of breaths I breathed on that way? You counted the number of, for example, people who I was able to look at with my eyes, that I was in good health and so on. Look, if you count how many things Allah has blessed us with, it's a lot more than what Allah has taken from us. Easier said than done, by the way. Easier said than done. Because when the crunch hits, it's much easier for you to say, I don't feel like praying. And then you can go on this actual run of missing salah for six weeks in a row simply because things aren't going well. It's on my terms. When it goes well, I pray. When it's not, I don't care about you. No. Zainab salam said, no, in all moments, always say hamd. Do shukr. Allah will give you even more. All praise is due to Allah, master of all the worlds, and peace and blessings be on my grandfather, just in case the people of Sham do not know who I am, on my grandfather, the prophet. Then she said a very important line where she made it clear that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't just love all his creation. There is this myth that Allah loves all his creation. Absolute load of nonsense. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, for example, those who are pious. Allah loves the truthful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the charitable. But the same Quran and hadith says Allah dislikes the hypocrite. Allah dis dislikes the liar. Allah dislikes the oppressor. So when those people come and tell me Allah loves all his creation and therefore maybe Allah loves Yazid. Uh, you show me ayahs in Allah yuhibbu. Why don't you show me in, in Allah la yuhibbu? Why don't you show me la yuhibbu? What does Zainab say? Evil will be the end for those who committed evil. Because they rejected our communication and used to mock it. She says, Yazid, Allah says in the Quran, evil will be the end for those who committed evil. Because they rejected our communication. Not just because they rejected, they made fun of it. There are non-Muslims living in London today. They reject Islam. They don't make fun of Islam. They just say, we don't agree with the theological concepts related to Islam. But they don't make fun. Yazid, when he begins to poke the teeth of Imam al Hussein, is making fun of the religion. Yazid, when he has taken Muslim females as captives, is making fun of the religion. Especially the granddaughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So those who come and say that Allah loved... No, Allah says evil will be the end for those who committed evil. They rejected our communication, used to mock it. Then she said, oh Yazid, do you think God made you honorable now? And made us contemptible? Now that the world is turned for you, our government is allocated to you. And our affairs are there for you. You've blocked the earth zones and the heavens horizons and you've held us captives. Because sometimes Yazid, like Ibn Ziyad, they used to say, if I'm bad, why is Allah put me here? If I'm bad, why is Allah made me win and made your brother lose? Predestination and free will. Allah predestined that I will win. When I killed your brother, it wasn't me, it was Allah. She looked at him. What did she say? She said, you think that God's made you honorable because now you have government? You clearly haven't read the Quran. Let not those who think that we grant them long lives is good for their souls. It's not. We grant them long life. We give them power so they may add more sins. And for them, there is a painful chastisement. How many times you've seen dictators in power, you're like, this dictator lives for 70 years and my son dies at five. This dictator lives for 75 years and this Maulana died at 35. This dictator lives for 81 years and this alim is executed at 36. Allah says, don't worry, because we give them long life. This is their dunya, let them enjoy. Because in akhirah for them, there is a painful chastisement. I've seen people who say, if really God exists, why is it bad people get all the wealth? Bad people get all the money? Bad people get all of this? And we don't get anything? No, 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 Allah is saying, listen, let them, let them, let them enjoy. These people, for them, there's a painful chastisement. She continues by saying, oh Yazid, oh you whose father was freed. Subhanallah, this is a huge line. 
O oh, you whose father, Muawiyah, was freed by my grandfather. Notice, she's not saying your father converts to the religion of Allah with reflection and contemplation and was a great Sahabi of my grandfather. Muawiyah, the most you could give him as a Sahabi is a favor, a job that he was a scribe of the Prophet, peace be upon him. That's the most you could give him. But this is the stupidity of our history. The man who was victorious at Badr and Uhud and Khandaq and Khaybar and Hunayn is the same level as a scribe. This is, this Islamic history is full of rubbish. I tell you, this religion, it has certain parts where the people who wrote history really mocked the religion. The man who has an aql will look at Ali and Muawiyah and say, Ayna thara min How in God's name is a man who's been part of this religion all this time Put on the same level as a man who Rasulullah freed. Freed. When you free someone, who do you free? You free a prisoner, don't you? You free an ex-convict, don't you? Otherwise, why are you freeing? Who are you freeing? On the day of the opening of Mecca, Muawiyah, free. The rest of you, all of you are free. Go. She says, Is it just? Is it fair, O oh son of those who were freed? Not those who converted, not the Muslims. In other words, she's saying, You know what your dad is? Your dad's an ex con prisoner, one of the most evil people, and my granddad let him out of prison as amnesty on the day of the opening of Mecca. Do you know that line? How much bravery you need to say? Honestly, do you know what bravery you need? Because literally there and then he could have ordered someone just behead her. There and then. But Zainab salam was highlighting slowly, just because I'm a female doesn't mean that I cannot break the power structure of the time. I can destroy the poison that sits in Sham and has sat for so long. Because in Zainab's eyes, in this sermon, that poisonous weed didn't begin with Yazid. Poisonous weed had grown for a long time. It's been there existing for a long time. Oh Yazid, oh you whose father was freed by my grandfather, is it fair your wives are all protected and covered? And the granddaughters of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family are taken as captives. As in when she's saying this, she wants Sham to listen, not Yazid. She knows Yazid is a gone case. Yazid is pure filth on earth. But the people of Sham, maybe the propaganda that's affected them, they might change their mind. They might listen and think to themselves that what's going on? This is not right. What is she saying? That the granddaughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, remember many of these people of Sham had either hate for Imam Ali alayhi salam, which I'll come to in forthcoming lectures, or some of them still had this reverence for the Prophet peace be upon his family. So when she says the granddaughters of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, some of them will be thinking, hold on a minute, granddaughters? Who's she referring to? And from there she then goes on to say, what is it fair that you disgrace us? By unveiling our faces. You see, for her, the sitter, what we later called the hijab, was fundamental in her sainthood. You could be someone who's knowledgeable, and you could be someone who, for example, is loved, but there still needs to be a balance of the physical and the social modesty, male or female. With Sayyidah Zainab, السلام, when it came to the veil, you know very well that they had snatched it off according to some narrations, had snatched it off them uh, somewhere in Karbala or in Kufa or in Sham. Somewhere along the lines when she says, is it fair that you disgrace us by unveiling our faces? It means that part of my sanctity as a saint was even my face is not shown to anybody. That's why you find people like Ayatollah al khoi may Allah bless his soul, would mention that this covering of the face can at times be wajib obligatory. Where some mention, for example, that if you believe your wife is beautiful and people look at her, then she would have to cover her face. Others might say it's optional. Say the Zainab says, is it fair that you disgrace us by unveiling our faces? Nobody used to know what Zainab السلام, used to look like except Imam Ali السلام, except her husband Abdullah bin Jafar, except Imam al Hassan Hussein. <coughs> now she says, Is it fair, O oh Yazid, that you unveil our faces? Today we have many lovers of Sayyidah Zainab amongst the girls in our community, amongst the ladies in our community. Many of them, in some cases, are not given confidence when they start covering themselves, covering their hair only. Forget the face, they cover their hair only. And you find some people in the community, 
attacking them, judging them, telling them you don't look good, not giving them respect. On the contrary, what you're doing, you're going in the line of Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. And we have some girls who don't cover. Try and now start with these majalis going on the path of Zainab alayhi salam. Zainab is not just a story for you to cry from. She's telling you that, look, part of my sainthood and purity in the eyes of Allah, which some believe affords her, and Asma to Sughra, was that I cared that I had a certain sanctity to my physical and my social appearance. There are some who say to you, I won't wear the hijab, but I have a good heart. There's some who will wear the hijab, but have evil hearts. We need to look at a balance of the two. You can wear a hijab and have a good heart. Why is it that one side looks at those who are covered and say, you know the girls who wear hijab, they're all hypocrites. The other side, you know that girl doesn't wear hijab, she is not religious. No, no, no. Try and not judge each other and try and build together. Zainab and Kulthum and the ladies built together in Sham. They stood firm with each other. They weren't judging each other. If you don't wear hijab, that means you're evil. Or if you wear hijab, you're a hypocrite. There's good apples and bad apples everywhere, but there needs to be an encouragement. She says, is it fair that you disgrace us by unveiling our faces so that everybody can see us from strangers to the acquaintance? Sham had some people who knew Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, like Sahel bin Sa'ad al-Sa'adi who was passing by. And it had strangers who don't even know Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. From the noble, there are noble men in Sham. From the ignoble. And there are dogs in Sham as well. There are people who are evil. While there is none to protect us. And then she blatantly cuts him the way you cut a Shah Warama. How did she cut him? She said to him, how can I hope for sympathy and compassion? from someone who came from the chewed liver of the noble and from the flesh of the martyr. This is pure outright tabarra in one line. The Jew, Yazid, how do I expect sympathy and compassion from someone like you? Your flesh has come from a cannibal grandma. His grandma, the piece of filth on the earth, was a cannibal. She was a cannibal who used to eat who? Eat human being like Hamza alayhi salam, cut up his liver and give it to me. I ask you, do you expect what to come from that tree? Honestly, someone whose grandmother is a cannibal, disgusting human being, Hind was, and they try and make an excuse for her. I don't mind, let them try because their framework has nothing to do with mine. But they try. They say that, you know what, she converted, uh, she converted and became religious later. Oh, might as well say everyone became religious. Everyone. The ex-convict became religious. The cannibal became religious. And they tell me, you, you have this concept called infallibility and I've only got 12. Imagine you guys, how many you have. So, Hind, what did he say? He said, Yazid said clearly. He looked, Sayyidah Zainab looked at him. She said, how do I hope for sympathy and compassion? Someone who came from true liver of the noble, born from the flesh of the martyr. Oh, Yazid, you don't consider yourself a sinner over what you've done. He didn't believe he had sinned. Why, why have I sinned? What's the sin? Nor do you consider yourself a sinner over this mortal blow. You boast about your disbeliever ancestors. Remember what did he say? I wish my ancestors from Badr were here. Later, she says, You boast about your disbeliever ancestors. He used to boast about them. She replies to him, You boast about your disbeliever ancestors, wishing that they were present to see what you've done. You poke the teeth of Abi Abdullah. Imagine, imagine where Islam had reached. <coughs> Wallah, it breaks the heart. And even a person chokes just thinking about it. Believe you me. <clears throat> the head of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam next to him. And he gets a stick and he pokes the teeth. Which animal would poke the teeth of a decapitated head? I ask you, who would do that? My dear brothers and sisters, this is the Islam that we're proud of. What you said to me, anyone can become Khalifa. Here, there you go. There you go. You had your wish, anyone became Khalifa, Yazid became Khalifa. Pokes the teeth, she says, you poke the teeth of Abu Abdullah, the children of Abdul Muttalib, the heavenly stars on earth. <laughs> what a description. Heavenly stars on earth. 
And then she says, but we'll be patient. Sabr. Fundamental for the saint in the face of trial is the archetype of patience, believing in Allah ma sabrin. That Allah is with the patient. We'll be patient since soon you'll be joining them. You're going to die. Two years after this, he died. Then you'll wish that you had not said what you said or acted what you acted. You'd wish that you were deaf and dumb. So you wouldn't say what you said or acted what you acted. Then she prays to Allah in front of Yazid because she knows the power of a female saint or the power of any saint is the dua they constantly have with God, that relationship. Because Imam Ali said dua is the weapon of the believer. So what did she say? She said, I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us our due right, takes our revenge, gives him a painful chastisement. Have you ever seen bravery like Zainab? Maybe her mother Fatima. And that's why you find after that, she said, Oh Yazid, you've now cloven your own skin and flesh. That's it. You've, you've, you've virtually laid your grave for yourself. You will soon meet the messenger of Allah. Allah turns distress into tranquility with the heavy burden that you've had. You've held his children as captives. All these children were next to her. You've disgraced him. And at the same time, what have you done? You've shed the blood of his household. But then she makes a statement to everybody in Sham. But you've all read the verse of the Quran. Look how fundamental the Quran is to Zainab, to the saint. She says, you've all read the Quran. What does the Quran say? Don't count those who have died in the way of Allah. This is pouring cold water on fire. Don't count those who have died in the way of Allah as being dead. Don't worry, they are alive. Receiving rizq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brother... You think you've killed him? My brother's legacy is above the grave. My brother, you think you've decapitated his head? My brother's message will continue forever. My brother, you think you finished him? He's just moved to a world known as Barzakh. And in that world, he's the highest. Don't count those who have died in the way of Allah as being dead. Rather, they are alive receiving sustenance from the earth. Enough for us. Is Allah with us? Yes. Is Rasulullah with us? Yes. Is Jibrail with us? Yes. That's enough for us. And those who pave the way for you to dominate over us. Yazid, you're not the problem. There are those who pave the way for you. Who are, why do they tell you don't do la'nat on Yazid? Why? Why do they say don't do la'nat on Yazid? If you do la'nat on Yazid, you must do la'nat on the one who appointed Yazid. And if you do la'nat on the one who appointed Yazid, then the dominoes keep falling. Who appointed who? Who appointed who? Who appointed who? Those who paved the way for you to dominate over us will soon find out whose army is weaker. We'll soon find out whose thoughts are inferior. Oh Yazid, although the plight has made me speak to you. This is this, is this world. It's made Zainab, granddaughter of Rasulullah, speak to Yazid, grandson of Abu Sufyan. This is this world. Don't think that the world, when it hurts you, you're not the only one. It hurts Zainab, daughter of Ali. Although the plight has made me speak to you, I find speaking to you, Yazid, of little value. But I find scolding you great. Therefore, I'll continue to scold you. I'm not going to stop. This is the moment I'm going to finish you. This is the moment everybody realizes my position, but also the message of my grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and who was victorious at Karbala, and victorious at Fadak, and so on and so forth. What did she say? She said, although the plight has made me speak to you, I find speaking to you of little value, but scolding you is great. Therefore, I'll continue to scold you. The eyes are tearful. The heart is sorrowful. How ironic it is that the members of the party of Allah are killed by the members of the party of Shaitan. Shaitan. She said, members of the party of Shaitan. Say to Zainab, why are you doing tabarra so openly? We shouldn't do tabarra so openly. We should have peace and have unity. But Sayyid Zainab alayhi salam looked towards him, said, You're from the Hizb of Shaitan. We are from the Hizb of Allah. We're the pure ones from the Hizb of Allah. And you are the nasty ones from the Hizb of Shaitan. Our blood drips from your pores and our flesh drips from your teeth and then she looks at him what you think is booty today tomorrow is indemnity it's a beautiful line
Today, wear your booty. <clears throat> you want to parade us? In a matter of time, you will see its indemnity. You'll see that it hasn't carried you anywhere. Your ideas are unstable, Yazid. And your government, transitory. It's, uh, every one of you, Umayyads, one will end up killing the other, fighting the other. Eventually, you'll fall within a very short time. Then she said, however hard you try, you'll never, ever obliterate our love and memory from the hearts of the people. Wallah, I had opened the Haidari Islamic Center just a couple of weeks ago, and I saw the alam of Imam al Hussein there at the Haidari Islamic Center. And at that moment, I said, truly Zainab was right. When she said to Yazid, however hard you try, you'll never obliterate our love and our memory from the hearts of people. Wherever we go, you'll hear us say, Labbaik ya Zainab. And you'll hear us say, Labbaika ya Hussein. Wherever we will be in the world, we will always utter those lines. You can go to Majalis anywhere on this earth right now, showing Zainab was victorious in Sham. And then what did she do? She said, I thank Allah. This is the beauty. I begin with thank, I end with thank. I thank Allah who gave victory and prosperity to the chiefs of the youth of paradise, Hassan and Hussein salam, and accommodated them with paradise. And I ask Allah to continue to raise their status and elevate them. Yazid knew at this moment, Zainab, the saint of Islam, had virtually finished him. And he knew at this moment that Sham slowly there was a change occurring. He also knew at this moment that Imam Zain al abidins sermon would be the double combo that was needed for them to eventually return. It's one thing saying all these lines. It's another thing holding the pain inside you. A saint, publicly, they'll always show you to maintain your strength, to allow you to have patience. Whereas deep down, their heart is broken. Deep down, you know that they've seen so much sorrow. Deep down for them, it's extremely difficult. Can you imagine the scenes when she'd walk through the bazaar? How many would poke her waist with spears? Imam Zain al abidin says, I would see them poke their spears on the waist of my auntie Zainab. How many of the children was Zainab the one who had to come near them to make them sleep? I ask you, who would help Zainab sleep? How many children did Zainab put on horses with no saddles? I ask you, who put Zainab on these horses? How many cities did Zainab have to go through where stones were pelted on Al Muhammad? Who was there to remove the wounds from Zainab alayhi salam? That's why why when they left Sham and they returned to Karbala, she headed towards the grave of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas alayhi salam. When she got to the grave of Abu al-Fadl, it's as if she wanted to open her heart to Abu al-Fadl one final time. Oh Abu al-Fadl, where were you when they slapped the cheek of your sister? Oh Abu al-Fadl, where were you in the ruins of Sham? Oh, Abba al-Father, where were you when Ruqayya called out, where's my father and where's my uncle? Oh, Abba al-Father, where were you? Where were you when they took us and they poked our waist with spears? Oh, Abba al-Father, Abba al-Father, where were you, my dear, when they pulled the hijab off our faces? And then from there she went to Abba Abdullah when she came to Imam al Hussein alayhi salam she said to him Abba Abdullah I carried all of the amanas that you gave me except one daughter I left her in Sham she couldn't take seeing your head in front of her she bid farewell to Abbas and bid farewell to Hussein but you know what was more difficult for her returning back to Medina returning back to the house returning Turning back to Abdullah bin Ja'far. When she entered 
entered the house, she saw two empty mattresses on the bed. She realized that her boys were no longer with her. All this time she held in her tears until when she saw the beds of Aun and Muhammad, it broke the heart of Zainab alayhi salam. I held in those tears because Hussein had nobody to cry for him. She also had a young daughter of Imam al Hussein. She had to go and talk to. Imagine the burden on that young daughter when she saw Fatima al Alila, Fatima the Sughra. She looked at her eyes, and Fatima looked at the eyes of Zainab alayhi salam. Do you know at the beginning, Fatima al Sughra didn't realize who it was? She said, Sorry, lady, I don't know who you are. I have not seen you. You seem to know me. She said to her, Oh, my niece. Don't you recognize your auntie Zainab alayhi salam? She said to her auntie, 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 where's my six month old baby brother? Auntie, 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 where's my beloved uncle Abbas? Auntie, 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 show me, show me my father Hussein alayhi salam. Any lady wants another lady to console her. It's only natural that sometimes that warmth is there between two ladies. But when Zainab went to the house, she told Bibi Fadda alayhi salam, don't let anyone come to the house. I need my alone time. I need to mourn for my brother alone. All of a sudden, the door knocked. The moment the door knocked, Fadda went to the door. Fadda was expecting to tell the lady that you can't come. Zainab is alone. She wants to mourn. The moment Fadda opened the door, she saw Abbas's mother and the mother of four. She saw Umm al -Bani the mother of the four at Karbala she turned around to Zainab alayhi salam why would Fadda turn around because she knew Zainab could relate to Umm al -Banin. she turned around to Zainab and said to her that you asked me not to open the door but in front of me is the mother of four the mother of Abbas doesn't feel Abbas no more what do you want me to say to her standing by the door. Zainab ran towards Umm al -Banin, and Umm al -Banin ran towards Zainab. Zainab called out, Wa Abbas! And Umm al -Banin called out, Wa Hussein! And in the background there was a silent sound, Wa Fatima! Wa Shahid! Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to raise us with Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Ya Allah, raise us alongside Sayyida Zainab alayhi salam. Allow us to receive her wasila in this world and her shafa in the hereafter. Ya Allah, allow us to visit the shrine of Sayyida Zainab and Sayyida Ruqayya alayhi salam. There are many of our brothers and sisters who are feeling unwell on a night like this with many different complications and health illnesses. Some are suffering from heart issues. Some are suffering from cancer. Some are suffering from COVID. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Recite all of us together, wherever you may be. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعاه ويكشف السوء. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa taala to bless us and our families and the originators of this majlis and the members of the production of Imam Hussein TV and to bless all of them, Arhumin, with the recital of a Surah Al-Fatiha and we welcome our reciter, Mullah Muhammad Abbas Karim, with the loudest of your salawat. Hey.